It is vlog 261 coming at you on a Thursday, headed on over to Peppermill. A year ago, I managed to have my best month of the year, one of the best months I've ever had in April. And I said at the time, you may recall, that I think part of the reason was is because I was just getting into a groove also with regards to fitness. Uh, shout out to uh, Sweat Fitness in South Reno, getting these uh, daily HIIT workouts in. Then I managed to suffer later in the year, not one, but two injuries. Uh, ended up dealing with rotator cuff tendonitis and then some issue with my right patellar tendon, which has truly been weird. So I've been having these two injuries that have been nagging on me for months. I'm pretty much getting back in the groove now, almost full swing into fitness. So I'm hoping that that'll then translate to what has been a very disappointing start to the year, uh, kind of turning around and picking up steam here at poker. Well, as of the last week, that's gone the other way. $4,000 down in about a week's time now. It has been almost unimaginably brutal. The highlight of which came uh, when I took part in a bomb pot, which I usually sit out, I usually use it as an excuse to get up and get some steps in for five minutes. But I decided to play this one and I pretty much got screwed over as much as one ever could in one of these pots where I had queen jack and I didn't have anything on the top board, it was ace high. But on the bottom board, which is also ace high, uh, the rest of the board was queen, queen, jack, deuce. Three spades out there. So I managed to make a full house in a spot where it was going to be extraordinarily difficult to be up against a better full house due to the blockers that are right in front of you with the aces on both boards. Now, obviously I knew I was not winning the other board. Turned out my opponent also felt that he was never winning the top board because he made a royal flush on the board that I made the full house on and his king high won on the top board against my queen high. So that was about as brutal as it can get and the bomb pots booking yet another sizable loss. So needless to say, I have work to do today at Peppermill. On this day, I'd wind up in the sixth seat on table one, buying in for 2,000 in a 0-5-10 game with the rock indicating the winner's straddle. The first hand could either be classified as very interesting or the exact opposite, depending on how you view it. I raised a 35 with ace-king. One player calls. The button three bets big to 175. He's a guy who has basically decided he's going to grind this game seven days a week on day shift now. He's actually graduated, apparently, from the 1-2 game to this game, so credit to him for pulling that off, which most people usually can't. But he always buys in very short and usually just prefers to jam his entire stack in preflop with hands like ace-king and ace-queen, as I've seen on a number of occasions. Not the way I like to do it, and it isn't the way that most pros do it, but I suppose if it works, it can be a winning strategy. He actually cost me a big pot recently when he jammed ace-queen all-in preflop last week. I folded pocket sevens and would have flopped a set against a guy who had opened pocket aces under the gun. Anyway, the point is, I've seen a lot of this. And we get the three bet in this spot. So what is the play here with ace-king? If I raise all in, it's certainly going to be hard to get called by a weaker hand, to say the least. But it's also very possible that I can get him to fold a hand like pocket jacks should I come back over the top all in for the $615 he has in front of him, which is actually usually more than he's going to have when he buys in. So I decide, despite this being the first hand of the day, that I'm going to see all five cards. I jam it all in, the other guy folds, and then a tank occurs, which is obviously good news. You want to fade the snap call in spots like this. 30 seconds go by. And I have the video to prove that to me. He says to himself that he actually wished he had bought in for a smaller amount so he could easily get the money in here pre-flop. I thought that might meant that he would fold in this spot. And I certainly knew at this point that he was going to fold a hand like pocket tens and maybe jacks in this spot. But I figured jacks are probably going to find a call. And after that 30 seconds goes by, he announces that he's calling by putting in a chip and asking twice. I agree to that. 
We have a $1,240 pot right out of the gate. I'm assuming this is a coin flip, but it isn't. He shows pocket kings. Something I was definitely stunned to see given how long it took him to call. So two boards are going to be dealt with me needing an ace. And as you can see, it shouldn't shock you given how ace king has tended to go for me over the years that I'm unable to find one. It's a frustrating hand. It's not frustrating to lose that pot with ace king. It's frustrating that it wasn't a flip. But either way, I get stuck immediately. I'd get on the scoreboard squeezing ace jack from the button and getting three folds. And then Mr. W limps, as does middle position two. The low jack makes it 50, and I have pocket sevens in the big blind and make the call, as do the limpers. With 200 in, I flop an overpair and an open ender, which was certainly interesting. Low jack bets big for 175, playing 800 behind. It's more than I wanted to call in this spot, but that said, I'm still going to go ahead and make it. Others fold, and with 550 in, the turn is a three. I donk lead the exact same amount that he bet on the flop. Now, if he's got a hand like aces or kings here, I gotta believe he's at least gonna think about this. But no thought occurs, and his cards immediately hit the muck, indicating that my sevens may have been the best hand anyway. I then flop trip sixes against a super OMC. This guy is impossible to get money out of. He always is going to have it, whatever it may be, when the money ends up going in. So in that hand, I'd end up losing about 200 to him in a spot in which I would fold trips on the river, where there's a 100% chance that he either had a full house or a really big flush, which clubs hit on the river. I'm not sure which of those two things it was, but I can guarantee you it was one of them. Speaking of that opponent, he opens under the gun plus one. Middle position two makes the call. And I have eight six of hearts in the low jack and come in here as well. Hijack overcalls, and Mr. W is in the cutoff and also decides he's seeing this flop. And with 155 in, I get a flop that is slightly above average. Plus one checks, which might as well equate to a sign saying that he has ace king. Middle position two also checks, and I bet right out with this making it 75. Hijack folds, and W calls quickly. Plus one checks out. And the other player ends up calling the bet on my immediate right. So with 380 in, the turn is the five of hearts. Great card for me, and after it gets checked to me, I bet $175. W folds quickly, and the player on my right claimed to have had a pair and an open ender and throws his cards away as well. The grinder who tanked 30 seconds with kings earlier opens early position to 25. Low jack calls, and I have ace jack in the cutoff and make the call as well. It was one of those plays where I immediately asked myself, what the hell was I doing? Because if this guy is going to be that tight, you shouldn't be giving him action with hands like ace jack. Anyway, point is, I can't always tell you what I wish I'd done. I can only show you what I did. W defends the rock in the big blind. With 100 in, we go four ways to ace, queen, four, two clubs, giving me top pair jack kicker. Under the gun, bets out for 35. And with my pair of aces here, I just call... With 205 in, the turn pairs the queen. And now, under the gun, fires 135. Low jack goes out, and I felt this was close. He's going to have a lot of ace-kings here, obviously. But I didn't know how often he was raising just 2.5x pre-flop with ace-king. But that said, I make the call. And with 475 in, the river is a complete brick. And now, he checks. I'd certainly value bet against some players, but not against this one. Content to go to showdown. I check back, and he turns over pocket fours for the full house. I found that funny because he is so tight. He's obviously folding most small pocket pairs pre-flop from early position, but in what can only be described as a rare instance of him playing one, he ends up drilling the flop, and I end up making the second best hand. I really should have just implemented a three bet or fold policy with this hand before the flop. Instead, I did the worst thing, and the mistake cost me. This is a mid-session update. It has been asked many times, and now I am pleased to deliver the news that Slick 
is back on our game. And I'll talk to him coming up. I'm in the plus one position and make it 40 with tens. W calls MP2. Hijack calls, and with 125 in the flop is ace, eight, 10. Rainbow giving me middle set. I play it fast, betting 55, hoping both players give action, and sure enough, both do. With 290 in, the turn is a three. Very good card for me to keep getting value. I bet 125 here. W makes the call, and the other guy, who I was thinking about there was a non-zero chance could be slow playing pocket eights, decides to get out of the way. So with 445 in, the river is the seven of diamonds. If he had a really big ace, I'd have likely heard from him pre-flop. And if he had two pair, I'd certainly have heard from him on earlier streets. So to get a call from a hand like ace six, I figured a sizing of about 175 was appropriate. Thinks about it for a minute before ultimately making the call. Creating a $795 pot, I show my hand and he mucks. I then battle W again in a spot where I actually sucked out on him when my queen jack ended up making two pair on the river against his ace jack. And I won a couple hundred there, still stuck several hundred on the day. Now, as you know, I am an extremely tight player. I only play the most premium holdings and would never raise a speculative hand because I thought I could play heads up against the one guy giving me all the action. I would never do something like that. Until I did here. I opened four seven of diamonds and got three collars. And once again, I would get a slightly above average flop. Wow. I would bet 80 here, playing this thing fast into a pot of 140. W only has about 240 left at this point, and he ships it all into the middle. The big blind, amazingly, only has about that exact amount as well. And he jams all in. So, it is always nice when you flop a straight and two players are all in, even if they are short stacks in this game. We have a $900 pot. I obviously have the best possible hand I can have at this juncture. And despite a seven hitting the board, no chopping would occur. And my admittedly poor decision to play this hand pre-flop works out well for me in this instance. And then after picking up pocket aces and winning a small pot on my way out the door, I would rack up, booking the comeback win. cashing out and wrapping up this session I kind of want to like use that quote from Happy Gilmore where he says man I should just try to put the ball on in one shot every time that's what I feel about uh, a couple of hands I managed to play today and flop straights with oh I should just try to flop the nuts every time I never thought of that so running good through the majority of this session outside of that ridiculous hand where I dealt with a 30 second tank uh, when I jammed all in with Ace King. Able to rally back and book a win of $842 after losing about 1200 or so yesterday, most of which that came in that ridiculous, stupid, obnoxious bomb pot, full house being less than royal flush scenario. Sadly, I still need to book like three or four more of these $800 wins to <laughs> dig out of the hole for the week but I firmly believe I will be capable of doing that. Giving you a look at the Sparks Marina. I'm sure a lot of you that have been to Sparks and didn't know that was there probably don't expect that to be the kind of place you'd find a marina, but indeed you do. Recording this on the morning of the day of game seven of the Golden Knight Stars series. So I'm either gonna be fired up or on tilt when you're watching this vlog. 
it really is way better to just be the number one seed and kind of steamroll your way through the playoffs like they did last year instead of coming in as the eighth seed and really having to grind it. But uh, hey, maybe they can catch lightning in a bottle. Who knows? Thought I'd get slick in this particular edition of the vlog. Apparently, that's going to have to wait, though he has said Slick Central's coming back, and he's been in the game uh, pretty consistently of late, so that's been fun. One thing I've mentioned before is my hatred of the bonus tax in these games, particularly once you get into the $5 blind level and above. Uh, you really should just keep that money in the pockets of the players instead of engaging in this dog and pony show, if you ask me. But that said... I got a chance to benefit from that bonus in a couple of different ways. One of them I benefited. The other one, the entire room benefited. Uh, when it came to me, I did something that I think I'd only done once. They have this quadzilla bonus. And I didn't get video of the hands, unfortunately. I got a picture uh, right as uh, the dealer Chris was preparing to sweep my hand away, showing that I had flopped quad tens and I wanted medium-sized pot there, a couple hundred, and that came only an hour after making quad kings, winning a little bit smaller of a pot. It's one of those things where it's like, you could probably play poker for 20 years, playing every single day for eight hours a day, and not have that happen. It's one of those fluky things that happened to happen to me there. But the more interesting thing with the bonus tax money and $2 a hand, rough, I think, but uh, you kind of saw it in effect of, the positive benefits that it can have on a poker room. And I first have to say, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I've always thought that May the 4th be with you is just really stupid. That's just me. Uh, but the Pep My Poker Room decided to make a promotion out of it where you get bonuses for making uh, certain hands with the hand pocket fours. And I think the bonus went up depending on how big your hand was, something along those lines. I never even got dealt the hand pocket fours during that session. But take a look at the room itself. Absolutely jam-packed for this. The Kentucky Derby was also going on. That probably didn't hurt. But damn. I mean, if they're going to run a promotion like this that's kind of fluky and it's not going to benefit that many people, unfortunately for local fave Dave B, he got totally screwed. He flops a set of fours and uh, loses to a gut shot straight uh, when that took place, losing a massive pot. So you can see that going on. But... It is amazing how things like that will get people in the door. And when it comes to these promotions that poker rooms do with the bonus tax money, that's the way it should be distributed. You know, I hate to say it, but the bonus that I just won, getting an extra $300 for making quads twice in a 24-hour period, that doesn't bring a single person into the room. But something like this, uh, that will. So shout out to whoever thought of that because that was a hit. Clearly, on May 4th, what a turnout at the Pepin Bell Poker Room. I was able to book a win that day, and uh, I mentioned going into this vlog at the beginning that it was kind of like a, a mini $4,000 downswing over a very short period of time. Well, able to win about half that back, as you can see on the Bink app. By the way, if you're looking to track your results and you want a good place to do it, that's the app for you. You can get 30% off. Just go through the link in the description below and use promo code DEACH. Hit those like and subscribe buttons and follow along on Instagram at Ben Deach. We're back next time. I can hear the demons call when they do what they do. And now I feel like taking off, find a place with a view. The pain is never gonna stop if it's controlling you. I know the time can heal it all. I just gotta get through. I just gotta get through. I just gotta get through. Cause I feel like taking off, find a place with a view. The pain is never gonna stop if it's controlling you. I know the time can heal it all. I just gotta get through. Sometimes I feel like all is lost, but I know it's not true I wanna put up all my walls, cause I'm not in the mood But then I cut myself off from the rest of the room I know that God can heal it all, if you're patient and soon It can all be worth it, all this